Greetings, Christ Church. We bring you this Christmas Eve service, pre-recorded but live in spirit. And we recognize that this wouldn't have been our first choice for worshiping on Christmas Eve, but nonetheless, this is from the heart. It's homespun, and we hope and pray it is to the glory of God and thanksgiving for the birth of his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So from my living room and yours, let us pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen.
like speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. reading from the prophet Isaiah, beginning at chapter 9, 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. 
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Chapter 2, beginning at the 11th verse. 
For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all inequity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. 
While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child living in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The Gospel of the Lord. Clearly, we are not all together on Christmas Eve. Certainly not the way we usually are. It is Monday, December 21st, from where I am, and I'm looking into the camera, and you're not there yet. From where you are, it's Christmas Eve, December 24th, or maybe it's not. Maybe at some other time, but we are nonetheless here together, together for Christmas Eve. This would be a pre recorded sermon. There are feelings about that. But I have to say that all of this has been unfamiliar for so many months, and we've done well. We've done really well reaching out to each other through the camera and the virtual world, staying connected and communing that way as much as possible. And it's also getting hard to remember what it was like before we did church this way, before virtual church. And this, again, is the first time that we've pre-recorded Christmas Eve or anything so I wanted to take some time to remember Christmas. I wanted to take time to remember Christmas Eve at Christ Church as we've always known it. And this is not, this is not to be torturous. It's not meant to make us ache for something that we've lost because we haven't lost it. We have it and we'll have it the way we've always had it again. This is actually meant to be grounding and I'm also, after I ask you to remember with me Christ Church, the Midnight Mass, I'm also going to say something about Christmas this year, 
not Christmases past, because I believe that this Christmas we are uniquely postured for a unique blessing. But first, but first, lest we forget, let's remember, because we're all thinking about it anyway, let's remember Christmas Eve, Midnight Mass, Christ Church. This, of course, is coming from me at the reception after this, or coffee hour Sunday, you can tell me, you can add to these memories. But for now, let's begin before the beginning. Let's begin at the uh, pre-service period of time where there's nervousness and excited activity. The choir is warming up. Visitors are arriving because they love this part. And they're beginning to fill the pews. And in the sacristy, we are bustling about. We're rehearsing how to pass off the porcelain baby Jesus so that when we put him in the manger, we won't drop him and break him. And from wherever we are, from wherever you are, whether you're in the organ loft or the narthex or the aisles or the pews or the chancels, we're all sort of waiting and watching and we're looking at the pews as the numbers begin to sort of pile up because we love when our pews are full. It is so much fun to have full pews on a Christmas Eve and to hear an usher or somebody wonder aloud, are we gonna have enough bulletins? Are there extra bulletins? Soon these pews I'm looking at them and I can see you there, especially if I just kind of do this. These pews are going to be full. And they're going to be full and bathed in various hues of red, people in red coats and red blazers and red hats and scarves. And the people who come to us will greet We'll tell them Merry Christmas. And it doesn't matter that some of them will have had to be dragged here by family who were begging them to come. Some of them won't quite be sober, and some of them we won't see again. But it doesn't matter because we're all here. They're all here. We're all here. And we'll watch their faces as they hear the Casparini organ, we'll watch them point to their children, the rare children that are allowed to stay up this late on Christmas Eve and come to church, and they'll, they'll point out the glockenspiels to the children, and the children's faces will light up or the children will be sleepy. But we'll watch for that moment because we know those moments. And whoever all these people are, they will belt out with great gusto the Christmas hymns as though They've been with us, all these people, forever, as though we've always been one big happy congregation. And in God's view, God's timeless time, we have been, we are, and are still here together in ways that we can't know. Kind of like the great cloud of witnesses and the incense the incense will furl around us and it'll rise above our singing into the heights of the chancel and up to God. And the incense will rise above our singing and the ushers will come forward. We'll have at least five ushers on duty and they'll come forward with such heavy collection plates, but some of us will try not to notice how full those collection plates are, and we'll have communion. We'll have communion in the fullness of time. We'll have communion. I hadn't realized this until I pondered Christmas Eve without communion this year. When it's not Christmas, the wafer in my hand feels appropriately heavy with a crucifixion and the death 
as well as the resurrection of Jesus. But on Christmas Eve, it occurs to me that that the communion bread is different, that on this night, I feel in my hand the wafer, I I feel the, the glory of God, the fullness of the glory of God inhabiting a corporal, mortal, but vibrant and vibrantly alive human body. Because Christmas communion is the fullness of God's glory inhabiting our own corporal, mortal bodies. This bread, this bread is so heavy with incarnation. This the flesh of God that's not yet crucified, but in this hour it's the word of God made flesh, born from the womb of the mother of God. Christmas communion, this bread, is incarnational bread. And we see his body, the body of Christ, how so like ours it is. And we see that this Christmas, even without communion, we see how his body is so like ours, it's, it's frail, it's utterly dependent, it's needing to be held, it's needing to be touched. This Christmas, this Christmas we know more than ever, What a precious sacrament in its own right human touch is. We see more than ever that that's a sacrament, a vessel of grace that has largely been limited to us over these many, many months. And so tonight, in his birth, In this body, we really see our own frailty, how we cannot survive without human touch, without human love, and how desperately we needed God to come to us with human arms. We will, at the Midnight Mass, line up in long rows to receive the bread of heaven, the body of Christ, And some of us will actually know what we're lining up for, and others will file into line simply doing whatever the other people are doing, the ritual. But the body of Christ will incarnate in everyone regardless. The bread of heaven will be fed to all with no preference and no discrimination because God doesn't pay attention to whatever rules we have about who's ready and who's not ready, who should and who shouldn't receive the body of Christ. And after receiving this communion and navigating the various traffic jams on our way up to the Word of God made flesh and coming back from the Word of God made flesh, after navigating those glorious little traffic jams, we'll dim our lights and we'll sing Silent Night And some of you will have told me that, because this is also kind of traditional, that this is sort of, it sort of smacks of Hallmark card sentimentality to dim the lights, to sing Silent Night. And I'll agree with you, but not not really. But part of me will agree with you. But so many of us know that even though it's slightly sentimental, we fall for it every year. I live for the singing of Silent Night with the lights dimmed, and I know you do too. Dimming the lights is actually a generous way to put it because at Christ Church, it's actually impossible to dim our lights the way they are. It's more of a and then, you know, one section of the pews is cast into darkness, and then then another section of the pews is cast into darkness and sometimes temporarily, accidentally, uh, the whole congregation gets cast into sort of this outer darkness. But it doesn't matter because we know the words by heart. And if that happens, the lights will just pat, 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 on again. And this is the part where I, I'm actually looking at where I kneel during Silent Night. This is the part where I always 
take my chance in the darkness to scan the faces, the ones that I can make out. This is the part where I scan the faces of everybody. And I look at our visitors, I look at everybody, but I notice that their expressions seem changed. And maybe that's because the most raucous, secular of visitors realize that this is the moment that you have to behave and be on your best behavior. Or maybe it's because, because people can't see. Or maybe it's because in this moment, suddenly people, their hearts are full of Christmas's past or of Christmas's missed or Christmas's longed for. And their hearts are full and that's, that's registering with them. Sort of an experience of the fullness of time, of, of God's time. It's nostalgia, but it's, it's something more. And this is also when I take my chance to scan your faces. I scan your faces because, because honestly, I feel close to you at this time. And I imagine, because I've known many of you for a long time, I imagine the Christmases that you're holding in your heart, your Christmases past, the Christmases that you missed or longed for, or maybe still yearn for. And I just feel such a closeness to all of you. And I know you feel it too among yourselves. I kind of feel it right now, but that would be hard to express on camera. But the point is, is this is a beautiful, this is a beautiful experience. And we will have it again. After this, we hear the clap, bam, bang, and the lights are thrown back on again. And then we have a thundering organ playing a postlude, after which there's thunderous applause all across the congregation. And the people file out of the pews, and we wish each other Merry Christmas, and we wish our visitors Merry Christmas, and our visitors say things to us like, this is, this is very much like a Catholic church, wouldn't you say? And they say things like, the music here is the grandest of any church I've ever been to. And they say things like, we wouldn't miss this service for anything. We come to this service every year, and we relish those words because we feel the same way. We wouldn't miss it either, unless circumstances called for us to miss it. And we love these compliments because, you know what? We know that we shine on Christmas Eve. We shine on Christmas Eve. And God shines through us here. God shines through us. God shines through all of the fineries of our liturgy, through the organs, through our sacred shining silver vessels, God shines through the costumes that we put on to do this liturgy. God even shines through the pride that we feel about ourselves on Christmas Eve. God shines through that as well, because God is God. This year, something different is being asked of us, and it's no less holy to God, but something different is being asked. This year, the light of the world made flesh does not shine through our usual, usual fineries and festivities, but it shines. Oh, it shines. I want y'all to feel that. And I think you will in your own way. But trust me, it shines. Maybe what's asked of us now is to pay attention not so much to how God shines through Christ's church and all of its grandeur, but how God shines in 
us in Christ's church and in us as individuals from wherever we are, separated from each other, in some instances isolated, but in this unfamiliar, lonely place, Christmas is coming to us unadorned this year. But it's so pure, and it is so real. And because of this, we can hear its darker, even foreboding tones. You know, we can better understand what the first Christmas would have been like for Mary and Joseph, alone as they were in a strange, unfamiliar city, hard-pressed and struggling, maybe wondering why on earth the Word of God couldn't be made flesh at a more joyful, if not convenient, time and place. Christmas comes to Christ Church this year much the same. It comes to us in the rubbles of a broken kingdom on which the plague has really shone its own light on more than ever. This plague has shown a light on the rampant injustices and the needless suffering that from quarantine we haven't been able to escape. So this year, Christmas finds Christ Church aching in a way we haven't in recent Christmases for righteousness and for justice, for peace, for all that the Advent prophets have prophesied. We're uniquely placed this Christmas. We are uniquely placed to be able to long for this peace in these dark months now and that lie ahead and to hear the words of the prophet and to trust mightily in those words. The people who worked, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the darkness, on them light has shined. Those who lived in the deep darkness, on them light has shined. And so we are in a dark but divine place this Christmas. We are able, if we open ourselves, we are uniquely able to receive the same prophet's assurance that unto us a child is born, we are given a son, the Prince of Peace, and he will establish his kingdom out of the rubbles of this kingdom. He will establish his kingdom, and he'll lead us in justice and righteousness and peace. So in this hour, on this Christmas, something new is being asked of Christ Church. Instead of opening our sanctuary to the multitudes of people who would otherwise come here, we're being asked nothing more than to open our hearts to this unadorned Christmas. Pure, unadorned, we're being asked nothing more from our solitude, from our stillness, from our silence, to welcome the words of the prophets and to receive the birth of our Savior. God bless you. Merry Christmas.
And now let us recite the creed of our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. That this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful, we entreat you, O Lord, that your holy angels may lead us in paths of peace and goodwill. We entreat you, O Lord, that we may be pardoned and forgiven for our sins and offenses. We entreat you. That there may be peace to your church and to the whole world, we entreat you, O Lord, that we may depart this life in your faith in fear, and not be condemned before the great judgment seat of Christ. We entreat you, O Lord, that we may be bound together.
We, we your, your unworthy servants, servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, our preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray you give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your grace, not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. May Almighty God, who sent his Son to take our nature upon him, bless you in this holy season. Scatter the darkness of sin and brighten your heart with the light of his holiness. May God, who sent his angels to proclaim the glad news of the Savior's birth, fill you with joy and make you heralds of the gospel. May God, who in the word made flesh, joined earth to heaven and heaven to earth, give you his peace and favor. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.
All right. Do a quick Betty Butter bought some butter, but she said mine butter's bitter if I bought mine butter, butter. Okay, I got it. I got it. <laughs> also, if you mess up, we'll just do it again. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, just like start over if you mess up. Okay. All right. We hope that. <sighs> Bell, pull it kind of fast. There you go. Yeah, that's it. And then it lets me know. Try it again. Okay. So yes, I am totally. I don't know if you appreciate this, but I am that chick from the New Yorker cover right now. Yeah. Now I have my jeans on. I was like, oh. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. From our home to yours, we wish you a very Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Look forward to hearing you sing while I play next year. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. From all of Christchurch organists and musicians, Merry Christmas. We wish that we could be together in the same room singing and listening and making music, but we are doing it this way and we our, our, our thoughts uh, are just as joyous uh, in greeting you with Merry Christmas. So thank you all.